Hi, welcome and welcome back. It feels very good to be in communication with you and to reflect a bit on the state of our minds and hearts at this time in our lives and in our world. In spite of everything, these past several days, at least in Cleveland, they've been gloriously sunny. And while the temperature has still been fairly chilly, although it is starting to warm up, if you had the opportunity to be outside in the sunlight, it felt quite wonderful. In fact, it made me feel at least a momentary hopefulness and well being, feelings that are in rather short supply these days. With the image of sunlight in our minds, let us pause and take our first break to breathe. So let us find ourselves in our meditative places and in our meditative positions and just sit comfortably, but with some alertness. And let us take a moment to do our inventory of our bodies and of our insides. So I always, I always like to close my eyes or just focus on nothing in particular. The idea is to be able to look inward, not to be distracted by anything that is outside of us. So just starting at the tops of our heads, let us imagine that our scalps are being released from the tension of holding on to our heads. And then realistically, perhaps we can unfurl our brows. And if you wanna take a few fingers and just massage your foreheads, that's okay too. It can, be, it can feel actually comforting and, and relaxing. It's always good to unclench our jaws, to allow our tongues to sort of hang mindlessly in our mouths. I just want to release all of those tightly held places. Let's imagine we can wiggle our ears or wiggle them if you have that genetic ability. The neck is always a good place to try to unkink the kinks. And it's always humbling to try to do that. But perhaps a kind of a roll or two around in the back and in the front at least suggests to all those held muscles that they don't have to hold on so tightly. It's okay. They can let go and your head won't drop off. And while we are in that most frequented area, that most troubled area, possibly for many people, myself anyway, let's take those shoulders and hike them up to our ears if we can, and just kind of hold them up there in order to ah, release them. Oh my, and that can be really helpful and to shake the tops of our arms and our elbows and our lower arms and maybe even twirl our wrists around gently, very, very gently and wiggle our fingers, not with any goal in mind other than just to release any tensions we accumulate in all of these places or at least imagine that we are releasing them. That helps, it really does help. And then I would turn our attention inward to our lungs, our digestive tracts, our tummies. Let's try to just let go. I think we hold on to our insides so very tightly. It's almost like if we hold on tightly enough, we won't fall, we won't stumble. 
we won't feel lost. We'll know where we are and where we have to go. Let's allow our waists to expand a bit. Feel comfortable settling into our hips, our thighs. Maybe even rub the tops of our thighs a bit. We can flap our knees back and forth, our lower legs back and forth. We twirl our ankles the way we did our wrists. We could even do them together if we like. Wiggle our toes and our fingers. And I think it's always lovely to kind of squeeze our toes into the carpet or the floor, imagining it's the sand on a warm, lovely beach. And then let us take that first deep breath, first deep, first mindfully deep breath. into all the spaces we've now released. There should be so much more room now for that breath just to come in, to fill us up all the way down our arms into the tips of our fingers, all the way down our backs, up our necks into the tops of our heads, down our legs into the tips of our toes. We might even hold on to the breath for a couple of extra seconds. And then let it go. And let us do it again. When it's comfortable, my, my rhythm will be different from anyone else's and every person's own comfortability with breathing in and breathing out will be according to your own internal needs. But that intake of breath feels so good. Sometimes it feels as if we haven't breathed in days, which is so silly. But it's a different way of breathing consciously, mindfully, intentionally. And we hold on to it with those same three qualities. And then when we let it go, it's not just a physical response. It's a mental exercise as well. Our goal is to keep our minds on this most basic of actions, what we normally can just take for granted. It helps happens automatically without us. But when we pay attention, it forces us to be right in this very instant. By the time we release the breath, that instant has moved to a new instant and that's why we stay with it mentally because it trains our minds trains our bodies and emotions to be living now right now no other time And since now is the only time we have, it allows us to appreciate our, to appreciate our lives as we live them, not in retrospect, not in anticipation, right now. And that's a kind of focus that is rare, and exceedingly helpful.
it feels to me from conversations I have had, from questions I have been asked, from articles and essays I have read, that we are suffering from a Hebrew term, kotzer ruach, which is an evocative phrase from the Torah portion of just a few weeks ago. It means literally shortness of breath. But in context, it means shortness of spirit or crushed spirit or anguish of spirit. The phrase is used in describing how the Israelites in Egypt would not listen to Moses speaking of God and the great deliverance that God would bring to them because their spirits were crushed by cruel bondage. I think we are suffering from that kind of crushed spirit or an insufficiency of spirit, which might be a better way of explaining it. As we discussed last time, it is making many of us feel paralyzed, ineffective, useless. If we stop to analyze the real source of our feelings, however, our insufficiency of spirit, I believe that our feelings come from more than the news headlines, as problematic as they may be. There is no question that we are sick with worry for Israel, horrified by anti-Semitism, anxious about the future of our democracy, about the state of education and literacy in this country, the vilification of intellectualism and scientific inquiry, the rank hostility to immigrants, the demonization of the other. We are sickened by what we see happening on our college campuses, on social media, with our own friends and family members. Underneath it all, however, animating our deepest feelings and reactions is, I believe, a raw and primitive response we may not even understand yet or recognize. Underneath it all, I think, is a profound feeling of betrayal. This is not the world we were promised. This is not the world we demonstrated for, prepared for, worked for. This is not the best of all possible worlds we thought we were helping to make happen with our education, our enlightened views of every human being, our belief in affirmative action, our work for civil rights, voters' rights, women's rights, and later LGBTQ plus rights. We put a man on the moon. Our horizons were limitless. The advances of science and technology were literally infinite and could be miraculous. We are not supposed to be fighting these battles again. We did this once already. Our incredulity borders on manic hysteria. Every bone in our bodies cries out, no, this is not the way our lives are supposed to be. This is not the way our story is supposed to end. And that is the place from which we truly have to retreat because this is not the end of our story or any story for that matter. That's the betrayal speaking with that sense of defeat. I worked so hard with that sense of futility. What's the use with that sense of hopelessness? We will never again. We can finish the sentence in numerous ways. I am not so naive or unsophisticated as to think that a couple of good motivational phrases might set us in gear again. Yes, of course. We know that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step that it's never too late to make a comeback, 
that it's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. That they know not their own strength, who have not met adversity, to never, never, never give up. And of course, we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. But those encouragements are for the second or third step ahead. We can't push aside our feelings. They are real and they are powerful. We have to at least acknowledge them to begin to lessen their power. We may not be proud of feeling betrayed, but if we are feeling betrayed by everything we believed was true about our world, we are enraged by the medieval sensibilities that seem bent on hatred and destruction. We are grieving the loss of our own idealism, the vision of a better future that at best is delayed a shared language of ethics and goals we thought were universal, a secure sense that we belong, that now seems threatened from every corner. We need to look our losses straight in the eye, as it were. We need to name them, to feel their reality in our guts, to feel the sadness of their loss, which is the sadness so much, so many of us are feeling seemingly 24 seven. I believe that if we can truly confront and sit with the reality of this time, not just in the headlines, but in our hearts, that we will be able to eventually move ahead. I finally realized that every time I responded to news I found upsetting with, I can't believe there are that many people in our country who, that I had to stop and reconstruct in my mind what I knew about their opinions and why they arrived at their conclusions. To keep saying that I can't believe it is a form of denial and a hope that others will come to their senses. That's not the reality we are living in. And I have always believed that we need to start with reality before we can change it. So let us endeavor to just breathe in and out, allowing whatever feelings we might have to rise to the surface, to acknowledge them, to name them, and to momentarily dismiss them. Deep-seated feelings are not so easily resolved, but I do believe that by acknowledging them, we begin the process of controlling them rather than allowing our feelings to control us. So let us reassume our positions, if we have lost them a bit, even do a quick internal check, check and checklist. And let us return to breathing deeply, mindfully. And at the conclusion, the formal conclusion of this session in a few moments, please feel free to continue breathing to continue concentrating, focusing on this moment of our lives. It can be so helpful because we know what this moment is and we can abandon the fear and the anxiety that normally we carry with us in so many instances. So let us take that wonderful breath. and hold it and release it. 
and let us do it again. And if feelings come up, feelings of fear or anxiety or discomfort, notice them, acknowledge them, and dismiss them and go back to the breathing. Whatever pace you find is the right pace. There's no right or wrong. Whatever is right for you is right. Just try, just try to breathe in deeply and release around that breath. And then breathe out again. Some people find it helpful to use a count, perhaps a count of, depending on how fast or slowly you count, a count of five or six or seven in, a hold of four or five or six seconds, and then a release to a similar number. And we might imagine that some of those negative feelings are leaving our bodies as we exhale. And our momentary positive thoughts are coming in with the next inhale. And that will happen even when we're concentrating solely on the breath coming into our bodies and the breath leaving. by way of conclusion, and perhaps as inspiration for the coming week, I would share with you this children's poem by Maya Angelou. And we all know that even her children's poetry is something from which we can learn, and hopefully something from which we can derive strength and courage. It is entitled, Life Doesn't Frighten Me. Shadows on the wall, noises down the hall. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Bad dogs barking loud, big ghosts in a cloud. Life doesn't frighten, forgive me, life doesn't frighten me at all. Mean old mother goose. Lions on the loose, they don't frighten me at all. Dragons breathing flame on my counterpane, that doesn't frighten me at all. I go boo, make them shoo. I make fun way they run. I won't cry, so they fly, I just smile. They go wild. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Tough guys fight. All alone at night. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Panthers in the park, strangers in the dark, no, they don't frighten me at all. That new classroom where boys all pull my hair, kissy little girls with their hair in curls, they don't frighten me at all. Don't show me frogs and snakes and listen for my scream. If I'm afraid at all, it's only in my dreams. I've got a magic charm 
that I keep up my sleeve. I can walk the ocean floor and never have to breathe. Life doesn't frighten me at all. Not at all. Not at all. Life doesn't frighten me at all. I look forward to seeing you next time. I hope the week ahead is one of courage and strength and comfort and a bit of optimism. Be well. God bless. Thank you.